Welcome to functions lecture. So functions help to reduce the amount of code, can be called anywhere in the notebook or cell. Functions must be given a name and can have multiple parameters or none at all. And a parameter can have default values. And really functions are applicable to any programming language, not just Python. Okay, so let's just start off with a very basic function. We'll do def, and that's what we used before we actually assign the name to the function. So in this case, we'll say square. And notice that this is lowercase, and that's the way that we have the function named. It's always going to be in lowercase, that's by convention. And then we'll put in our arg1 and arg2 and colon. Then we'll do return arg1 plus arg2. So functions always have def before they have the name. They don't always necessarily have to have return. It can be a print as well. But there is an important distinction between print and return. I'll show in a moment. So we have square. Let's say we put in 20 and 50. And we should get 70 as the output. And what we could also do is, let's say we have num. And now we actually have num assigned as 70. So we assigned a variable called num to the value 70, the integer 70. And the interesting thing is if we were to remove the return and just have prints, and we of course have to encapsulate the arg1 plus arg2, and then we try, we'll get the output of 70 because it's been printed. However, if we were to then run num, we don't get any output. And that's because print doesn't actually assign the value of 70 to num. Only the return does that when you're using functions. So if you want to actually assign it to a variable, any kind of calculated value or, or a string or anything of the sort, then you have to use the return, not the print. And we do this again, and we have 70 as we had before. Okay, and what we can also do is assign default values as I stated before at the beginning. So say so we have 20 and 50, and then we remove the values here. Let's call this val instead, just in case. And we run this, run that, and now we have 70. So we don't actually have to put any values in the arg one and arc two within the actual function when we're calling it, but that's because the arg one and arc two already have default values. But we can actually override them. So let's say, for instance, we do 90 and we do 110, and we should get 200. And then we run that. As you can see, we have 200. So we've over overridden the arg one and arg two default values. What we can also do is add what's called a doc string. So just make some space here, so it's getting a bit cluttered. And of course, that's by not one double string, but you need to have three on either end. So a total of six altogether. And we'll just write some sort of description of what the function does. This adds two numbers together. Okay, so nothing's really happened at the moment, but if you hover your cursor in the parameters section of the function and hold shift and tab, you can see you get signature, which gives you the square arc one and arc two with the default values, but it also we have the doc string where it says this adds two numbers together, which is what we wrote here. And if we hit the plus icon, we've got the location of the function in memory, and of course it says type function. Okay, let's just remove that. And what else we can do is just check. So we do type square, and it tells us that it's a function, just like we showed a moment ago when we did the plus, and then we have the type function here. Okay, so moving on from that, and what we're going to do is scroll down just to make some space here 
and we'll delete that val and we could do def squared as opposed to square num colon and we'll do return num and then we'll do def cubed num colon return num through this time and lastly we'll do quad num colon return num raised to the power of four so once raised to the power of two three and four respectively and if we do v equals four and then let's make some spaces here scroll this down and if we hold the control and then hit left tab then left tab we'll do print and then we'll do squared v so the variable v equals equal to four we'll just change this to cubes and of course the last one we'll change to quad we run this so you have 16 64 and 256 okay and what we can also do is actually add the values together because we're returning them we can add each of the values from the functions squared cubed and quad together to make a final value so if we do total let's say squared v plus cubed v plus quad v we do total we should have a total of all three of these numbers we have 336 okay so moving on from that is something a little bit more interesting and that's going to be the greet function so we do def greets to take any parameters we'll create a doc string let's say enter the time and print appropriate appropriate greeting okay we've got time equals eval inputs enter the time and then we'll do some control flow so time if it's greater than six so it's going to be either good morning afternoon good evening or good night so if time is greater than or equal to six and time is less than 12 colon print good morning whoopsie good morning Exclamation mark. and if we do return squared time and then we'll do actually we'll leave this squared time for now i'll show you in a moment what happens there in a moment but we'll do a left time greater than or equal to 12 and time is less than 18 colon print afternoon and then lf time greater than or equal to 18 and time less than 21 so obviously this is 24 hours in a day so this would be 6 is 6 a.m. 12 is the afternoon and greater than 12 and less than 18 is between 12 and 6 p.m. and this is going to be between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. and we'll do print good evening whoops keep doing that mistake and then lastly if it's none of those it's obviously going to be good night and then if we run that let's say we do and before I actually run that just to point out that we do time or rather if we do input enter a number and we enter let's say 90 we get a string as you can see here because it's in the single quotation marks so what we have to do is convert this into an integer or a float rather we've got to convert it into a number so we're removing the strings 
and we do this, and say we do 8, we get an actual integer in this case, or we could do say 9.123, and we get a float. Okay, so it's no longer a string, and then we can use that when we're doing the conditional operators. And if we just remove that, and let's say we do greet, now we can put in any number that we like, so it's between, let's say we put in 10, we get good morning, because it's in between 6 and 12, and if we run this again and we do, let's say we want to have afternoon, well we do let's say 14, good afternoon, run this again, and we do 20, we're going to get good evening, and lastly, if we do 23, which is going to be 11 p.m., we get good night. Okay. And lastly, I want to just show that if we did the return as opposed to the print squared time, and then we'll do cubed time, and we'll do, oopsie, that should be a return here return and then return quad time and for this one at the bottom we'll just do return time okay now if we do free we get good night free and the reason why it's only free as opposed to any of the other numbers is because it's not greater than six it's less than six so it's just going to be referring to the else, so you just get free put out. But let's say we do seven. So we run and put seven and that's going to be 49 because that's going to be with the squared, which is four times, which is sorry, seven times seven or seven squared. And therefore you get 49. Even though they had to be able to do something greater than 12 or equal to 12. So if we do 12, we're going to get a cube number, which is going to be quite large, 1728. And if we get a larger number, so if we do 18 plus, then let's do 20. We're going to have 160,000. So it's going to have the good evening and it's going to return. And what we can do is number. We'll do this, and let's say we do seven again for good morning, and then we have number, and we get 49. Okay, so that concludes my lecture on functions. I hope that's been insightful, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Welcome to Random Lecture. So Random is a module that requires importing, and it's a default package that comes with Python. It generates random values, so if we were to do import random, we run the cell, and then if we do random.tab, and as you can see, we have a list of all of the methods or functions that we can apply in our code. And there is, if we were to do dir, which is a built-in Python function, it's something we'll cover in a future lecture. If we run this, and what we have is a list of all of the functions and methods, and these are special methods, that we can apply by using random. And if you want, you can use the len, which is another built-in Python function, to count the number of these strings, which are actually the names of the methods and functions from random, and this will give us 61. So of course, we're not going to be covering all 61 of these methods and functions from random, but we'll cover the main ones. And we're not actually going to import this as random. What you can also do is rename it. So this is the default name random, but you can rename it as let's say RD, or it could be anything else like bar or car, etc. But I try to put it as something that's appropriate. So import random as RD. And then we'll do say rd.random and this will generate a very long number so it's going to generate a 
floats, in this case it has many decimal numbers, and it's between 0 and 0.99. So it's never going to be equal to 1, as you can see here. And if we were to do rd dots, let's say, rand int, and I were to hit, say, 10 and 20, and it's going to generate a number between 10 and 19. It's never going to actually be 20. So we have 14, 17, 11, and then what we can also do is rand range, and if we were to take in start, stop, and step, so let's say we do 10, 100, and 10, and so it's going to be between 10 and 90, so you have 80, 60, 50, etc. And also, bear in mind, we can also do this. So we could do from random import star. And what this will do is instead of actually having to do the rd.random or the random dots, we can simply call these methods or functions directly. So if we're to do random, we get the same output as we had before in the cell above. Or we were to do rand int 10, 20 like before, 11, 18, and so on. But personally, I find it's much more useful to just simply do rd. As so long as you've referenced it at the beginning and made it clear, then it makes sense to simply do this because it's very difficult to memorize all of these methods and functions from random. So you simply have access to this list that you can always check out if need be. And I would encourage you to do so. Okay, so let's just scroll down a little bit here. And let's do let's create a list. So we do rd.random. And as you can see here we have that very long number and we can actually multiply it. So we have all these numbers here. And we could try rand int. And we'll put in 10 and let's do 50 and 100. As you can see here, we can change this number, of course. It doesn't have to be. There we go, 95, 71, and so on. Okay. And what else we can do is rd.uniform. And this takes in two parameters, so we do two and five. It gives something very similar to the dot random method, but instead of being between zero and nine, zero and point ninety nine, it's any number that you've chosen here. Okay. And if I just to reinforce the point about how it can't be more than this number, so let's say we do three it's never going to be equal to 3, as you can see here. Okay, so moving on from that, let's say we do animals. This can look a bit strange at first. So what I'm going to do is actually, without the square brackets, I'm going to create a tuple. And you see there's actually going to be a mistake in a moment. And I'll explain why. In fact, when I run the code, it will actually explain why itself. We'll do dog. And what this is going to do is just generate these strange looking strings. Is it going to generate some images of animals that's built into Python? So we'll do snake. And let's say we do horse. Okay, we'll do animals. And as you can see here, we have a tuple of cats, dog, snake, and horse, which I think is pretty neat. And if we just do type animals, as you can see, it's a tuple. Now, my favorite function or method from random is the shuffle. So we do dot shuffle, and then we do animals. This is actually going to cause an error. And what it's saying here is that 
tuple object does not support item assignments. So remember that the uh, the elements within the tuple cannot be mutable. So what we have to do then is convert this into a list. So just wrap this round and now this should work. And if we do animals, actually if I just leave that for now, it won't actually do anything at the moment, but if we then run this, as you can see, it's changing the elements, in this case these animals, which are strings, in this list, it's swapping them around. And we could also do index, so we just get one of them, the first one. So we have a horse. Is that a dog? That's a dog, isn't it? Cat. Cat again. Cat again. Then a horse. Okay. So moving on from that, let's create a list of heroes. So say Batman, Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Captain America. Oops. America. Okay, and then we'll do naturally we'll do villains. And we'll do the corresponding villains. So Joker. Say Venom, I guess. Thanos. And I guess Red Skull for Captain America. And now we'll do numbers, list, range, len, heroes. Could be villains as well. And obviously, this is going to be four. Well, zero, one, two, three, which is if we put four in here instead of len heroes, it would give us the same output. And what we're going to do is rd.shuffle heroes. And we can actually do it on the same line with the semicolon. rd.shuffle for the villains. And then we'll do for i in numbers print, oops, print heroes i do versus villains i and as you can probably guess it's just simply going to shuffle both of these lists together about who's fighting who so captain america versus thanos batman versus venom iron man versus joker we've got spider-man versus joker uh, batman versus red skull so cool all right so moving on from that what we're going to do is a menu. So we do a menu this time. And we'll have noodles, cashew with tofu, and coconut rice. Okay. Now we do rd.choice menu. And we run this. And it's very similar to the shuffle. But essentially all it's doing is with the shuffle, if you remember, we scroll back up actually, where I was doing the index of zero. That's basically what choice is doing. It's using the shuffle and then doing index of zero. Okay. So it's very, very similar to shuffle. And then similarly, there's something called choices. And we'll do let's say probabilities equals 0 0.25. What we can do actually is multiply by 4. We'll do probabilities. Okay, and then we'll do students. Let's say Gracie, Callum, Blaze, and Tommy. And then we'll do rd.choices as opposed to choice. Students, and then do probabilities. Okay, so basically all of them have an equal probability of being generated. So we have Blaze, Blaze again, Tommy, etc. But what we can do, let's just comment that out, is let's say we want to have Gracie be 90%, and 
and the others be very, very low. Let's see. And lastly, zero. Let's do that as zero eight. Okay, so ninety percent, one percent, one percent, and eight percent, respectively, for each of these names. So generally speaking, Gracie is going to be generated almost always because it's ninety percent probability. So we've got Gracie, 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 and what we can also do is k equals so if you want to generate two or three or even more so we've got two graces here or if you want to do 10 so it doesn't care about how many elements there are or how many strings there are within the students list okay and moving on from that is our final random and that's going to be rd dot sample and we'll do range and say 1000 and we'll do k equals 4 run that and as you can see it's generating a number within the range of 1000 and we've got 4 and we could do let's say 10 and what we could also do is let's say so 10 and 40 and it has numbers between 10 and 39 and you have 10 of them and we could just do 3 or we could do let's say 100 okay it has to be within that makes sense it has to be within this range here okay so I want to do 30 there we go and if I wanted to do say a hundred, then I would have to do okay, let's put that as a one. There we go. Okay. So it's randomly generated all of these numbers here that you can see. And we have a total of a hundred. So if I were to do len, this should give me a hundred. There we go. Great. So that concludes my lecture on random. I hope this has been insightful. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks. Welcome to built-in functions lecture. Built-in Python functions are always available on commands. As of Python 3.6, there are a total of 68 built-in functions. And if we click on the link to the official doc, we'll be taken to a page called built-in function. And bear in mind that sometimes they're also known as built-in methods. Hence, we have method here as opposed to function. And they're in alphabetical order from A to Z. And let's say we search for one, let's say max. We get returns largest elements for description. We do sum, we get add items of an interval. Okay, so I'd encourage you to check out this page here. And going back to the Jupyter Notebook. So all we're gonna be doing is covering just 12 of these built-in functions. And I'm sure some of them look quite familiar to you. So reading from top to bottom here, we have max, min, sum, rounds, absolute, print, pow, sorted, eval, format, any, and all. And bear in mind that with newer versions of Python, the number of built-in functions might vary from time to time with new releases of Python. So let's just scroll down here. And what we can also do if you're still unsure of any particular built-in functions is you can do the help. So this is a help built-in function. Let's say we do max and it will tell you about the built-in function. We could do eval or we could do print, which we've seen many times before. Okay, so moving on from that. Firstly, what we're going to do is import random as rd. And then what I want you to do is rd.seed10 so that when you generate the random numbers, it's going to be the same as mine. I'm going to call a variable numbers. We'll do rd.sample range 1, let's say 10 to 100, and k equals 10. So we have a range between 10 and 100, or rather between 10 and 99. 
and we're going to have 10 of these randomly generated numbers and they should be the same as mine so you should have 83 all the way to 93 okay and before we carry on any further with this numbers what we'll do is just some examination of the built-in function so we'll do max with numbers of course that's 93 and the lowest should be 11 which it is 11 and we can also sum all the elements within this numbers list so we do numbers we have 558 and if we were to do let's say round so we have 9.12345 rather to two decimal places we should get 9.12 or if we wanted to do four it should be 9.1235 so it's rounded up the four to five and we can also do absolute and this will convert a negative number into a positive number and if we have let's say a positive number 10 it will also just remain a positive number and if we do a val which we've seen before we'll convert a string of a number into an actual number or if we were to have instead of a integer 4.5 that's fine as well it converts it into a number as well in this case it floats and then we could do pal so if we do pal 2 it should give 16 which of course is the same as 4 raised to the power of 2 with these two asterisks here and you also get 16 we have to do 10 we should get 100 okay so moving on from that is let's say we create a new variable new numbers equals sorted so we're sorting the numbers list that we created from lowest to highest and if we take a look again at our numbers list so you can see 83 to 93 so it's arranged in order and what we can do then is let's say for instance we have to do list comprehension where we have pal and we do x2 for x in new numbers run this so essentially what it's doing is raising each of the elements 11 to 93 by 2 and if we were to do let's say 11 we should give 121 so we do pal 11 2 and we get 121 okay great so moving on from that let's just delete this and scroll down a little bit here and we can kind of refer to this one if need be so let's do another list comprehensions and we'll do i greater than 40 for i in new numbers and what we have here is boolean outputs so we have three false booleans and seven true booleans and what's happening of course is that we want to do new numbers of course 11 14 and 36 are not greater than 40 therefore you get false and the remaining numbers are going to be true because they're greater than 40 and let's say for instance we want to use the any now the any will give a boolean output of true or false so if any of them within this list are true it will give an output of true which it does however when all all of the booleans within this list comprehension have to be true otherwise we'll get false which we do so in order to get a true output with the all built-in function what we have to do is simply do some slicing here so we want to get rid of the free falses then we do free colon we run this we get trues only and then we do all and now we get true as the output okay so what we can also do is actually sum all the trues within this list comprehension and 
That's because if you remember, true has a numerical equivalent value of one. With false, it has a numerical equivalent value of zero. So we should have seven as the output because there are seven trues here. Great. And if I were to turn this round to less than 40, we should get three, which we do. So it's counting the number of trues. In this case, there are three trues. All right, so moving on from that, let's create a new variable called data. So we have a string of 10, 8.12345, 100, minus 30, and minus 200. And we run the data. Great. Okay, so we have string, floats, positive integer, and two negative integers. And let's say we want to add all the values together, so we do do new data. Well, what we have to do, of course, is use the eval. So we have zero, then plus, and we want to have it as an integer output. So we have data one. So this is going to convert the float to an, int to an integer, plus data two. And what we need to do with data two is, that should be fine actually, because it's just an integer, but data three and data four, we have to wrap the absolutes to convert them into positive values. And then we have new data. And there you go, 348 as the output, okay. And let's say, let's just scroll down here a moment. Let's say we have a string, so the top three values. And I'll explain in a moment why we're putting these numbers in the curly brackets. So we want the top three values from the new data, or rather from the data. So this would be this here. And we want only integer values, and we want them to be positive, and we want only just numbers. We don't want a string. So the top three values are going to obviously be 200, 100, and then 30. And we want to put them in this string here by formatting. And 2. And then we'll do my favorite number is... Let's say the number is one, so that should be 100 here. So what we're gonna do is have the highest value to the lowest value of the top three numbers within this data's list. And then we're gonna put in the favorite number, which is gonna be 100. So how we go about that? So we do format. And before we do this line here, we actually have to do some code, but we could do it all within this parentheses, but it's rather long-winded and it will take up too much space. So what we'll do is let's create a variable called clean data. And we'll do absolute, we'll do absolute k for a k in. In fact, actually, before I do that, let's do int to make this a bit more clearer for i in data. So we're going to convert all of these to integers. So this is going to be an 8 instead of an 8.12345. And there we go. And if I were to do 0, we get 10. And if I check what type it is, this should actually just be an integer. Great. So it's converted it into an integer for us. We don't have to actually use the eval function here. But the problem is we still have these negative numbers, so we have to get rid of these two. So how will we do that? Well, let's create a new variable called clean, call it clean data. And we're gonna do a list comprehension inside of a list comprehension here. So absolute k for k in. We don't actually need these parentheses anymore, so just to make it a bit clearer, I'll get rid of that. And then we run clean data. And this should convert the negatives into positive values. There we go. Okay. 
And then what we want to do is some slice notation here. So we want to just have these three values. I will want the 200 at the beginning, then 100, and then 30. So how do we go about doing that? Well, what we do is we could actually do it all in one line, which I will actually. So I'll do it here. If we do four, so two columns. So we're starting with the four, which is the last element, 200, and then we're counting backwards. So this is going to reverse the entire list. There we go. So 200, 30, 100. And what we need to also do is sorted. So we wrap sorted around it. And this is going to actually, if I just remove that for a moment. So what we have to do here is go from 8 to 200, and we want just these three, and then reverse the round. So we're able to do that should be two, should be three actually two here, okay? And then we want to reverse this round. So what we can do is what I just showed before. It should be there. We go. Okay. So now we can put the clean data in the formats, but if we do just clean data, this is actually going to cause an error. Okay, so index error, tuple index out of range, because we have only three elements, which are 200, 130, and we have a total of four of these curly brackets. So what we need to do is firstly this, and that will add on the numbers for 0, 1, and 2. But what about this one here? Well, this should work, actually, because what it's going to do is take the 100. Let me run this. There you go. And if we were to change this, so let's just say the string itself, the top three values, 200, 130. My favorite number is 100. So 1 is here. And if we were to change this to, let's say, 2, we'll have 30. So 30 is the output. And if we change this again, 0, we'll have 200. Great. OK. So that concludes my lecture on built-in Python functions. I hope that's been insightful. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Q&A. Thanks. Welcome to functions exercise lecture. So we have a total of four tasks here. The first one is import random inside a function with two parameters. And what I want you to do is work with this code here, this incomplete code, and you can just simply copy and paste it into an empty cell if you're using the PDF, or just simply pause this video, copy out this code, and then give this a try by referring to the hints, the final input and the final output. So what we have here is the final inputs so the first one and the second one, and they give their own respective outputs, as you can see here. And the hints are as follows. Number one, name the function compute and import random as rd. Number two, the function computes has two non-default parameters, rad and num. Number three, the for loop uses both if and else control flow. Number four, Use calc.append in two parts of this function, one for the if and the other for the else. Number five, for the if statement, use modulus, where modulus two is greater than, is equal to num, and is greater than 10. Then number six, don't forget to use the return at the end of your function. And lastly, number seven, for the prints, use the sum for calc. So if you don't use the return, you won't get the output of these two lists here. And if you don't do the sum, you won't get the summation of these two lists, which gives 56 and 60. OK, so moving on to the second task, which is call a nested function and modify its default parameter. So what you're going to do is have a nested function called lang. 
and you're going to call the lang within another function that you're going to create called udemy. So you're putting the lang function inside of udemy and you're going to call lang within udemy along with udemy's own print statements. And then you have the desired output of my favorite language is Python. The coolest part about Python is functions. And then you've got these hints here, there's four in total. So number one, create a function called Udemy that uses a single print. Number two, for Lang, the default parameter is JavaScript, which uses the format function. Number three, for Udemy, the parameter can be changed. It also uses formats. And number four, call Lang inside of Udemy. And you'll get this output here, as you can see. So moving on to the third task. So function repeats another function with inputs. So what you're going to be doing here is similar to what we had in the second task where you're using a nested function. In this case, the nested function is greet. So you've got default name equal to Michael, and then you have print hello there. And then you have the desired output. So as you can see, it's repeating the greet function three times because it says hello there three times with the names for each of these students. So Michael, Sarah, Callum. And then you've got the hints. So number one, for the function repeat, and that's the name of the function that you're going to be using where the greet is going to be going inside of, use a parameter called n for the for loop. So if you think of n equal to three, then it's going to repeat this function, the greet function, three times. Number two, in repeat, use the input method and assign it to a variable called name. And number three, place the greet function inside the repeat function. So you'll want to have repeat have its own print statement, which is going to be student name. Okay. But that's going to occur within the inputs. So moving on to task four, and this is probably the largest function that you're going to come across within this course. So task for function with control flow and formatting. And what I want you to do is work with this code here. And as you can see, we've got to add in a total of seven lines of code. So you need to add logic for these control flow statements, the if, the elif, and the other elif. And then you've got to do something here it should be quite obvious considering these are strings with curly brackets and as an example it says how many zombies are there so you put 110 in for the inputs then Michael is running from 110 zombies and the hints as follows are number one use the eval and an operator I'm not gonna tell you what operator it is it should be quite obvious though number two for the if statements zombie between one and under 20. So what you have here, scroll up, is zombie. There's a reason why I'm assigning zombie from zomb1, the inputs, and you're gonna to have to use the eval function somewhere there. And then number three, for the first LF statement, zombie between 20 and under 100. And then for the second LF statement, zombie between 100 and under 200. So give all of these a try. And don't worry if you aren't able to get them done. Uh, the solutions are going to be available in the PDF. And good luck. Welcome to Functions Exercise Solutions. So for task one, import random inside a function with two parameters. And what I've done is simply copy and paste this code here. And you'll notice that we have nine lines of code that we have to fill in. Okay. So we just scroll down here and we have the final input. So we have first example and the second example and then the respective outputs for both of them. So 56 and 60 along with their two lists. And we have the hints here as well. Okay, so starting off with hint one, name the function compute and import random as rd. So all we'll do is def computes colon, and then we'll do import random as rd, which makes sense because we have rd.c10. And that's simply there to ensure that you have the same values as me. Okay, so hint two, the function compute has two non-default parameters rad and num. 
So we'll do rad and num. Number three, in the for loop, use a both if and else control flow. So we want to put if and else under this for loop here. So we'll delete this and put in if. And we'll delete this here and put in else. Okay, and then number four, use kelsey.append in two parts of this function, one for the if and else. Okay, so all we do here is kelsey.appends s because we have an empty list called kelsey. And we'll do the same here under the else. Okay, so number five, for the if statement, use a modulus where it is underscore where it is percentage sign to is equal to dumb and greater than 10. Okay, so what we do here with the if statements is we wanted to use modulus to equal equal to num, which is our parameter here, num, and numbers i is greater than 10. And number six, don't forget to use a return at the end of your function. So we'll just scroll down to make some space here. And we'll delete this and do return. And then for print, use the sum for cal C. So we'll just simply do sum. And that should do it. So if I run this, there's no errors so far. Okay, great. And let's do compute 20, 0 and compute 21. So we can do compute 0. And we get 60, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 18. And if we do quint, compute 21, great. So we get 56. And that's exactly the same output as what we have in the desired output. So 56. 17 and 0, and we have 60 and 0 and 18 as the last elements within the list. Okay, so moving on from that, we'll go on to the second task, which is call a nested function and modify its default parameter. And we're working with this function here, which is simply outputting a print statement. Okay, so we've got the final input of Udemy, Python, and we have a desired output of two print statements from one function called Udemy. So my favorite language is Python. The coolest part about Python is functions. Okay, so we've got our hints here. So number one, create a function called Udemy that uses a single print. All right, so I've just taken the liberty to copy and paste the initial function called lang. What I'm gonna do is def, Udemy and the parameter can be changed. So let's call the parameter program. And it's not a default program, hence it can be changed. And we want to have formats. And if I scroll back up, we've got the coolest part about Python is functions. So what we want to do is print the coolest parts about and then we have the curly brackets is functions dot format and then we'll do program and then what we also want to do is call lang inside of Udemy so lang program and then that should do it so if we do Udemy, we'll put in Python. We run this. My favorite language is Python. The coolest part about Python is functions. Great, so it's exactly the same as the desired output. So moving on to task three. Functions repeats, function repeats another function with input. So we have work with this function here called greets, and we're gonna repeat this a total of three times. So we have a default parameter of Michael with print hello there, Michael with exclamation mark, we've got desired outputs. So you'll notice that it has hello three times. And that's because it's repeating the greet three times within our repeat function. 
So I've taken the liberty, of course, of copying and pasting the greet function. And now we're going to do the repeat function, which is, as you can probably guess, just a full loop. So repeat, and we'll have n. So it's saying n is the parameter to use for a for loop. We'll do colon for i in n, or rather range range n colon and we have name so it says here for the second hint in a repeats function use the input method and assign it to a variable called name so we'll do inputs and it says here student name so we put in student name and then we do greets so place the greet function inside the repeat function and then we put name and that should do it so if we run this code now for this particular function repeat we'll do repeat and we'll do it three times because the outputs of the greet function is three times hello there three times as you can see and the same with the student name three times so we just scroll down here and we'll put in Michael, oh, made a mistake here. So what went wrong? Greet is not defined. Okay, so we have run that code there. Try again. Hello there, Michael, Sarah, and then Callum. Great. So it's exactly the same as the output that we had above, as you can see here. Well, okay. So moving on from that is our last function or last function technically yeah it's task for function with control flow and formatting so what we want to do is work with this code here it's a big giant function and of course I've taken the liberty to copy and paste this into an empty cell and as an example of the desired outputs as an example of the desired outputs we have for example, how many zombies are there? 110. Michael is running from 110 zombies. And then we've got our hints here. So we just scroll down. So number one, use the eval and an operator. I didn't say what operator it was, but it should be quite obvious. It's going to be the and operator. Okay, so what we want to do is convert this into an eval. So zombie into an eval. And let's put some code here. So for the first if statements, zombie between one and under 20. So zombie greater than or equal to one and zombie less than 20. And then we want to also do for the first LF statements, zombie between 20 and under 100. So zombie greater than or equal to 20 and zombie less than 100 colon and then we'll do zombie for the second LF between 100 and under 200 so greater than or equal to 100 and zombie under 200 and then we'll do the formatting. So this should be quite straightforward. What I'll do is simply do the control and then left tab, left tab, and left tab. And then we'll just delete this. That's going to be a slight problem there actually. But don't worry about that right now. So dot format. And then we'll do name. zombie and that should do it okay that's fine just need to delete these here okay so if we run this this should be working okay now 
So let's say we want to get the output that we had above. So how many zombies are there? 110. We'll just use the default name Michael for now. So we'll do survivor 110. Michael's running from 110 zombies. Great. Let's just try 9. Michael's fighting 9 zombies. And we can also change the name. So we'll put Daryl. We'll put in 220. Carol is eaten alive by 220 zombies. Okay, great. So that concludes my lecture on the solutions to the functions exercise. Hope this has been insightful. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks.